Hi everyone, welcome today. I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you decided to join us. And my name is Kim Buck. I am the facilitator or whatever, <laughs> expert, I guess, of this webinar. Um, happy to be here. Tammy and I are both at a conference. So if we look like we have twin artwork, that's because they, <laughs> they put that in our <laughs> So we're in St. Louis today and uh, in different rooms, but in St. Louis in the same hotel. So. So glad to be with you. Um, I, like Tammy said a little bit earlier, I am working with Dr. Rob with his pro-dependence um, paradigm and treatment model for partners and loved ones and family members who are affected by addiction. Um, I work in Mesa, Arizona at Family Strategies Counseling Center. So we work a lot with um, sex addiction and betrayal and partners. So I don't mean to lean that way, but sometimes those are my easiest examples. But certainly this model is uh, valid for anybody who's in a relationship with anyone who's struggling with any sort of um, addiction at all. Alcoholism, drugs, gambling, that doesn't really matter. Or even chronic mental illness can show up the same way. So um, I said earlier, I'll say it again, think about what you'd like to ask or the comments you'd like to make. The more interactive this is, the, the um, more we'll learn together and you won't have to just listen to me yap the whole time, which <laughs> I wouldn't want to listen to. So um, we'll kind of go from there. Sometimes I have a topic I'll start with, um, just kind of a a, a healing topic that might be useful to you all. And, um, and then if you have questions about that or something else, uh, Tammy will grab your questions and ask me. So do we have any to start, Tammy? We do. So the, the first one is, I have a question about self-care. Both the podcast and the book mention the importance of self-care for partners in the weeks and months following discovery. But Sometimes it is hard to focus on self-care between the crisis of the addict and the sense of numbness and tiredness. So how do you get partners to focus on self-care and what sort of self-care activities in particular do you recommend for partners who just discovered that they are living with an addict? That's a great question. It is a great question. And it's what you're saying is really true. It is really hard um, to do self-care when you're in crisis and um, when you're living with addiction, if you're the partner or family member, you're in crisis a lot, um, most likely. And especially the really, really early stages before I really know what's going on. And, um, but even not, even later on, even if I've known it for a while, sometimes it's, it's a roller coaster. It's, it's, it gets you kind of dizzy. So um, self-care, we stick to really basics um, to start. And even we stick to basics throughout life. So you might add to those, but um, I typically uh, recommend self-care in four specific areas um, to focus on. One of those areas is your physical health. So typically we'll have partners um, or family members really focus on a couple of things they can do every day for their body. And that's anything. That's that's sleep, that's diet, that's exercise, that's grooming. I mean, I might just be able to brush my teeth that day and I have to make that a goal. That would be self-care sometimes for someone. Um, spiritually, how I take care of myself, a couple things I do every day to connect with my higher power or connect myself spiritually in whatever belief system that is in. Um, uh, so a couple of things every day, uh, spiritually, a couple of things um, relationally, that would be my connections with others, um, which really um, we don't get better alone. We have to get better in community and we have to have a village. We have to have um, good connections that are safe and healthy with other people. It doesn't always have to be people who have a similar story. Uh, it might be people in our family, but we need a couple of connections every day. Um, to kind of get out of our, you know, get out of our own head and that kind of thing. And the last one is, why can I not think of it? Uh, <laughs> spiritually, <laughs> I'm like, woo! Physically, spiritually, um, relationally, relationally, and there's another one. I'll come back. Oh, personal. You got to do things for yourself. Things, your hobbies, your um, interests, those kind of things. You, it's really easy to lose yourself in those you know, with all the craziness that happens. So if I'm a gardener, I want to make sure I'm still in the garden now. And, you know, particularly maybe every day that just might ground me and help me with the crisis. Um, so it's very individual, but those four areas are, tend to be the ones that we try to address first. And, 
and will be the most helpful. And sometimes those might change from day to day or week to week. Um, I kind of do my, I call them daily goals or dailies is another way people put them, but I kind of look, I revisit them weekly and, and I kind of look at them and look and see what areas I need to maybe adjust or add to or take away from. So hope that's helpful. It is, I'm, but let's, I'm, okay, I, I like all the things that, and you know, you said sleep, diet, exercise, grooming, and I'm like, okay, so, so I get, yeah, kind of those, but you know, like it doesn't have to be, well, like tomorrow I'm going to go run a marathon. You know, I think if it's just like, to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a, a 15 minute walk in the woods. I'm going to, I mean, like, but I, for me, it would be making a list and making it more concrete, attainable, not you know, I'm gonna go run a marathon tomorrow, but you know, like, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna pick, you know, I'm gonna pick a few so that I know I can have success with it and feel good about it, but, but achieve it too. And, um, you know, this is, you know, connecting with, I mean, there's so many different ways, maybe, you know, connecting with my higher power. For me, when I'm out hiking, it's a very, it's a very connected to my higher power thing. So I'm doing an exercise and connecting with my higher power at the same time, you know, so, um, so I think that there's a lot of things that you can do that, you know, that aren't, you know, it isn't like so complicated that, that it, I, it doesn't, you don't want it to be like, now I've got this other thing I've got to do, you know, but if you can do it so that it's like, you know, I'm going to just do this and, and even small time um, amounts. Um, but if it's something, you know, I, I think it helps you connect and I think it helps you check those off the list, but it also, you know, uh, becomes an attainable thing where you can feel good about like I actually did do, you know, something for myself. I love that. Yeah, break it down to very sometimes. And again, when crisis hits, the last thing you can do is the last thing you want to do or a partner will want to do is to, you know, blow off the roof and do all these crazy things. We can't do that. Sometimes we're just kind of breathing in and out every day. So yeah, you I, I sometimes it's good to point out like, what am I already doing? What are the things that I'm already doing? And let's just make them intentional. Yeah. You know, like, um, if it's physical, make sure that I'm going to bed. I'm not having really crazy conversations with my partner or my kid or whatever after 10 or 11 at night or something like make sure that I, you know, I, I give myself permission, which is a big piece of it. Give myself permission to take care of those physical needs. If I'm not eating well, and that happens some, sometimes because the pendulum just sort of swings in some of these areas, maybe I'm eating to cope or I learned not to eat to cope, but I need to make sure that I'm feeding my body. So I'm feeding my brain, which will give me more ability to, I mean, brain needs food, body needs food to cope. So, um, and needs healthy food and needs the right amount, you know, that moderate amount, um, like, Tammy said, physically find, you might already be exercising, but let's make that deliberately one of my, you know, every day I'm going to do something for my body in that way. I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to, you know, whatever it is I'm going to do, walk my dog. I might already be doing that. <laughs> let's make that one of my daily goals. Um, relationally is probably one of the most difficult for partners and for family members because um, typically people feel really isolated in these moments. They're just you know, who would ever understand this, right? And um, in maybe some of your, the relational connections you make won't, you won't tell them all of what's going on, but you just need to go have fun or you need to go, go to dinner, go get a pedicure with a girlfriend, go call somebody on the phone, even text, that's connection. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be huge and rock your world. But the whole idea is because we have a kind of a tornado blowing, we want to create as much stability and balance personally, if I'm the caretaker, or I'm the partner, or I'm the family member that's kind of swept up in all of this, I want to create as much balance for myself as I can. And if it's somebody I love, you know, that's because addiction is just automatically out of balance. It just, you cannot, you addicts are generally not in balance and they're living in extremes in a lot of different ways. So even that modeling, if it's a child, for instance, that's struggling with drug addiction, even just modeling good, healthy, not only is it good for you, but it could be modeling that for somebody else. So anyway, yeah, keep it simple, especially yeah. on, keep it simple. Well, it, it, yeah. I, and I was thinking to, a couple things too, with the, you know, on the airplane, they always say, put your, your, your um, oxygen on first before you help others. And it's like, this is like putting your oxygen on first, you know, you are no good to, you know, to anyone else 
you know, if you can't be good to yourself. So, so I think that that's really important. And I just shared with somebody that was struggling with, you know, some sleep stuff. You know, um, she indicated she wakes up, you know, in the middle of the night and then can't get back to sleep. And someone told me about, it's called four, seven, eight breathing. And it's just a, it takes two minutes. And um, I have, I, I heard about it a few years ago and I started using it and it's kind of a mindfulness thing. So I kind of put it down to, you know, it can be a, uh, a spiritual thing too, but it's also, it helps me go to sleep or relax. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a YouTube on it. So, um, but it's, it's, you know, four breaths, you know, hold for seven seconds, breathe out. It takes two minutes. You do, it's super easy you, or you breathe in for four seconds. I can do it. If I, I can't say it, but anyway, it's, it's super easy. You do it four times. That's it. He says, don't do it more than that. So it's not like you have to build up to 20 minutes, you know, it was super helpful, but I, you know, that really calms me. I noticed not only does I, do I go to sleep, but it helps calm me down. If my little brain is going, Wee, it helps calm me down. So that's something I've been able to do intentionally, you know, when I notice myself, um, you know, revved up or if I'm having difficulty getting to sleep. So, so I, I think it's like just finding some, you try different things and try, you try something and go, well, that didn't really work. Try something else and be kind to yourself. That's my big thing. Be kind. That is, that is so important. And I love the breathing idea. Um, remember when anxiety sort of hits, one of the main things that happens is our uh, breathing and our heart rate go out of sync. Um, so the way we get those synced and it reduces that anxious feeling is mindful breathing, rhythmic breathing. So Tammy gave you one idea. I do what's called a box breathe when I'm like that. Um, so it's easy okay. for me to remember, so easy in my head. Even if I'm sitting with somebody, I can do it. Um, <laughs> but it's like a literal box and every box has a four second four second things every side so i breathe in for four seconds i hold for four seconds i breathe out and i hold so it's just a yeah. very intentional box yeah. that i do and it will generally if you do that for a few minutes it will your heart rate and your breathing will go back in sync and your anxiety symptoms will start to decrease doesn't mean you won't still be stressed or worried because that's not going away right away maybe but your body you'll have better, a better chance at managing your body and those reactions, sweaty palms and racing heart. And, you know, I'm head breathing. I'm not breathing below yeah. my neck, that kind of stuff and sleep and all those things that your body needs. So yeah, it's a great self-care item. Yeah. I love that idea too. Cause it's, you know, I can visualize and it, I think a lot of it's a focus. Kim and I were together and th th there was a moment at this conference and I realized as soon as, it was, as the moment passed, that I wasn't breathing and she said I was breathing for you and I was like oh that's so good you know but, but I, I noticed I held my breath so when you're talking about the box breathing I'm like oh that would be a very good thing to intentionally focus on you know on breath and you know staying within myself and everything so I like that so we have another question All right. I am struggling with balance of having expectations of my husband for recovery so I can feel safe versus am I managing him he is not self-motivated to work on recovery, so is doing the bare minimum because he is so overwhelmed with everything else in life. He keeps slipping about once a month or more often when we continue to cycle. I want to ask him to send me a plan of action for trigger times, but he still says, I don't know what to do. I'm at my wits end with what to do next. If I step back and do ask for nothing he will continue to do hardly anything and probably slip then i won't be able to give him my heart and then we are both lonely and isolated i feel paralyzed to surrender all of this is to him is just him and still wait i feel paralyzed to surrender all of this to just him and still be in a close relationship i can't just let go of it i wonder if it's best to just not know any more about the slips or anything and pretend it doesn't exist to give unconditional love i am stuck yeah, that is really difficult um, because the controlling piece, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. Like, I don't, I don't want to be controlling. That's not my way. Obviously, you're even asking the question, you know, am I being controlling? But I feel like if I do nothing, um, I'm just going to keep getting hurt over and over and over because he's not, for whatever reason, he, it's, he's struggling to get into his, you know, his plan or use his tool or do whatever he needs to do. Um, so there's a couple of things that come up in my, you know, come to mind as, as I was listening to the question. Um, 
absolutely we don't want to get into managing somebody else's recovery primarily because then it, they don't the, in this case your husband won't own it himself and he needs to feel the full weight of the successes and the struggles all of that belongs to him but it impacts you so um i think though you have every right to say what it is that you need um and that you might have to say that a bazillion times and maybe you already have um to say what you need and why um and to set whatever appropriate boundaries that you need around some of that um if he's in really if he is in active active recovery you should see a reduction in slips over time. I don't know what that time looks like, but, but you should see a significant reduction. However, not everybody gets it at the same pace and at the same time. Um, and I'm not saying that to give an excuse for him, but, um, but it, that's, that's the truth of it. And however long you can hang in there through that is really uniquely yours. You know, somebody might be able to hang with this situation for a little longer than someone else. Um, I would go right back to what we talked about when we first started today is all of my own self-care, all, you know, all of all the things I can do to stay in balance and in check while, you know, I sit by and hope that he grabs on to his recovery fully. Um, and you know, slips aren't necessarily an indicator of whether or not somebody's in recovery that happens sometimes. I know nobody likes to hear that. No one, but sometimes that's a, that's an opportunity for learning, but if they're happening and there doesn't seem to be a reduction and maybe I'm not, you know, I'm repeating patterns over and over, then that may be a really important discussion to have. And this might be a good place for couples therapy, maybe even to sit down with a, a, a therapist, a qualified therapist that can, can help kind of figure out what's going on and how long he's been in treatment and, you know, and all that kind of stuff and figure out where we're stuck and maybe help, help you guys along. That's kind of where, where I'm, what I'm Yeah. Thinking. Well, and, and, um, and I, I would beg you not to just pretend because like that, in my opinion, doesn't work, you know. Um, he has not earned your trust yet, so you not trusting him makes sense. I think you can love him and not trust him. I, you know, I, th I think it's about creating healthy boundaries. You know, I like what Kim said about finding a qualified, you know, therapist. Seeking Integrity Los Angeles offers a three-day couples workshop that might be a really good place for you guys to start. They also have a three-day workshop, or we also have a three-day workshop for men that kind of, it's um, it's kind of a little jump start on, you know, on getting some help. Ideally, I mean, if he's kind of in this cycle, we, we've treated a lot of guys that, that kind of get in this pattern where, you know, it's like, I can be okay for a while, and then it just keeps kind of you know, going into that cycle. Um, uh, so I, I would invite a higher level of care. And it may be that you have to, you know, I'm, I think it's fair for you to say, you know, th this isn't working for either of us. You know, I'm, I, and I love you. I want what's better for us. If he hasn't read out of the doghouse yet, I would invite you to do, have him do that because that's a plan of rebuilding trust. And on some level, it's like, you know, we are better than either of us. So how can we, you know, move forward? You know, you clearly love him, you know, and that's awesome. And I think, it's it's valuable to tell them you know I really love you and I care about you and th this isn't helping either one of us so um but I, you know I do I, I agree self-care good boundaries for you what's going to be okay uh for you he ultimately is in in charge of his own recovery or not but you can have you know I can't you know I can't keep, keep doing this. I don't want to do this. So, you know, how can we move forward and, you know, invite them into the process with that. So. Well, and I want to say too, there's a piece of that question that said something like, um, if I do nothing, if I do something, if I do nothing, either way, I'm not getting my needs met, whether or not I say or do anything. So you said I'm stuck. I think he's stuck. It sounds like he's stuck wherever he is in his his recovery process i love tammy's idea i think out of the doghouse is really good but and i don't know what the degree of his acting out behavior is if it's pornography and masturbation or if it's bigger than that but either way he may he you know he may really benefit from a short intensive to kind of you know kind of foundation yeah a little bit of what's going on with him 
Yeah, because she adds, it's been five years of this pattern. Now that that's a long time. I'm, you know, and you, you know, that's a long time for both of you to be in this. Um, I, 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 so I had the, I had the privilege at the conference last week, uh, so two conferences ago, of the the author of Beautiful Boy, um, uh, did did a live. Q and A, and I was I was in the room, and it was really good. And he went. He talked about the trauma that the loved ones go through. They were in that struggle for ten years, while his son, you know, kept, um, you know, kept escalating on the drug use, and you know, almost died. And and he said the level of trauma that they endured as a result of that, you know, it, it took a toll on the whole family, you know. And so you've been in a kind of a post-traumatic or in the trauma for five years so so and I'm not a qualified therapist like Kim is but I'm thinking this pattern you know you don't want to be five years from now still repeating the pattern so you you ask about stating a boundary uh, you know what is setting a boundary you know a boundary may be if you you know if you relapse again then you know, I want you to get a higher level of help and it's going to be this, you know, I mean, I think that's a really clear because from an addict standpoint, you know, continuing to fail because, you know, continuing to relapse isn't, doesn't feel good either. So thoughts, Kim? Yes, I agree with that. And I want to say to um, an example of a boundary and my guess is you might be thinking I've set every boundary I can think of other than leaving him. That's, that's, a, that's just a guess that I have. Um, five years is a long time. And so I agree with Tammy, you may, the boundary may just be like, you need to find, there needs, something's not, you haven't got what you need or you need more. Um, um, a higher level of care is a good way to put that. I don't work for Seeking Integrity. I want you guys to know, but their program is, and their intensive programs are remarkable. So if that's the case, maybe like she said, just an intensive, like a three day or a week or whatever that looks like of maybe, you know, keeping, sometimes addicts come, they do certain, they go see their therapist once a week, go to groups, but maybe they need to be out of their normal um, day-to-day routine for a little bit. And sometimes that can shake loose and with really, of course, qualified and good help. Uh, you know, Dr. Rob is, Dr. Rob works very closely with the therapist there at Seeking Integrity and you just, you just can't get better care there. So that's an idea for sure. And um, as far as the other boundaries, I mean, there's going to be little ones along the way. You may just have, to, uh, my guess is you've already said, you know, if you keep doing this, this is how I feel and this is what I'll need. But, you know, I guess my question would be how, like, what else do you need to do, you know, for you and if it's not enough the you know you may have you may be in more of a decision place than you know about you know kind of drawing some lines in the sand around you know how however long you can handle that acting out behavior which i would assume is getting really tiring for you yeah yeah and, and without sacrificing your integrity of just you know pretending like it doesn't you know like well I, if as long as i don't know it doesn't matter because it does you know i mean it it does so right uh, so the next question my husband is not emotionally intimate it's not pornography because he hasn't had a slip in over a year he just isn't able to respond when i express my needs i feel like we are roommates living in the same house what can i do to create more intimacy with someone who doesn't respond well to my needs this is a really great question and it's a question that i hear frequently so i want to just validate that that you're not alone there um uh, addiction particularly, it looks like this is sex addiction on your husband's part, is an attachment disorder at its root. So it's not about sex. So I could stop using sexual outlets, you know, to deal with my emotions or my stress or whatever, but I still might not know how to make healthy connection, not even with my spouse, somebody that I really love. Um, that is not unusual. So to me, if he's been sober for that long, I would definitely be talking to a therapist, maybe getting into some EFT, emotionally focused therapy with a qualified EFT therapist. Um, 
that is emotional in reintegration and learning how to speak emotional language with each other. Um, so often I hear this, well, he got sober, I feel better, but we are still not connecting. We are not, I feel so lonely still. And that is because now we've got to go and figure out how to really work on those attachment wounds within the relationship. And maybe even the lack of attachment from the get-go on some level. Not that you don't love each other. There wasn't passion and fun and connection, but, but there's some levels of connection. If I was in an addiction, if he was in an addiction that probably didn't, um, weren't solidified. Um, so that would be my best recommendation at this point. Um, and also being careful with the internal dialogue with yourself and hopefully he'll be careful with that too. I don't, we are wired for attachment, but very few of us get really healthy models of attachment in this crazy world, right? That we live in. So, so a lot of people don't know how to do that. Addiction just further complicates it. It just gives me an outlet outside of the relationship to put all of my energy and my, but attachment and attached to. So if he attached to his sexual behavior, it's not a reciprocal relationship. He cannot get back nurturing and love and attention and honesty. You know, pornography is for one purpose only, and it is not for connection and attachment. It's for release and, or fantasy or something like that. So learning how to do that is a whole other skill set from being sober. You do emotionally focused therapy, correct? Um, I do not actually. I refer my couples for emotionally focused therapy to somebody in my office who does that. So there you go. So that's an answer to one question. So <laughs> that's one. So, okay. That's not one of my specialties. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So is there any way to find partners in my area? It has been two years since D-Day. My husband was arrested and was in prison for 10 years. I have been in therapy and found SA Anonymous somewhat helpful. How do you find partners who are divorcing the addict? Any suggestions? Okay. Um, I'm just going to, I think this is in the chat. Is that right? I just it's in the to chat. Know. Yes. I, yeah. Yeah. I want to be sure that I can read it so I can answer. Um, I, I, I'm going to invite you to come to the drop-in groups and there are people on the drop-in groups who um, uh, are, are connecting out. So like, like if Kim and I met on a drop-in group and we decided, oh, we want to you know, get together or we want to, you know, Zoom, there are, there are people that have been doing that on the drop-in group. So that's one way. So even if they aren't in your area, I'd invite you to think, uh, you know, bigger than your area. I ask, yeah, but yeah, thoughts on... Yeah, um, I, I think one of the, uh, there's, there are, there are support groups like 12 step groups and that kind of thing um, that you can find for people who are dealing with or have dealt with, and maybe they're even getting out of relationships like you're talking about. Um, the struggle sometimes with 12 step groups is they sometimes still use this codependent model about partners. So you would have to very strongly let everybody know that's not where you're coming from. You really just need support in, you know, taking care of yourself, creating balance, boundaries, you know, moving into this next phase of life outside of the marriage and, you know, healing from the extraordinary losses that happen, that have, I'm sure happened throughout them, you know, through, throughout the marriage is why you're not staying, you know, you can't stay in it any longer. Um, so that's one place. Sometimes church groups will have, you know, sometimes churches will have support for women who are dealing with infidelity. And even if some of them, i um, even in my programming, I've got, uh, that we do in my office, we have kind of an out big outpatient program for sex addicts, um, or compulsive sexual behavior and partners and betrayed partners. And, there's probably 30% of the partners who are either not staying in the marriage or out of the marriage. You will find people in your situation or people who are thinking about going that direction. You know, you'll find people who will understand where you are, I think. But finding them, I think SI, uh, the Seeking Integrity website, Sex and Relationship Healing is a great place to start to, um, to just kind of get connection and get community with with other women and other people who are dealing with similar issues and may also be divorcing and and this is a little different but it might be helpful for you too i think on in the rooms so in the rooms.com and you do have to register for that site but I, and dr rob does a group there um uh, on friday nights at 6 p.m oh, he's gonna do it later tonight um but but i think if i recall uh 
Sophia Caudle, C-A-U-D-L-E, has a grief group on that. And that might be a really good fit because, you know, what Kim was saying about the losses, you know, it, it's, you've got multiple losses, you know, include, you know, including the divorce and the, but, you, you know, you lost your husband to an addiction, da, da, da. That might be, you know, something that you find helpful too, because it, that might be a place you, that can help. Um, process some of the the grief of the loss, um, and and there are some church groups and sometimes local groups. Sometimes the grief is about losing like the death of someone, but some of them are more inclusive. You know the 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 grief and loss groups. So you, that might you know, there might be a local group you know as well, and then another idea to help you know kind of shift things is find some people locally to connect with that are doing fun things that you like to do. So, so it's good to process all that stuff and have connections, but it's also good to, you know, to have something fun to look forward to. So, you know, Kim mentions gardening. I, that would never be something I would do, but, um, but you know, there, there, you know, it, it, I would encourage you to find connections with local people that, you know, just can be a, a source of joy and support for you in a different way. So that, that might be helpful too, so. Thank you. I, I also think I, I, along those lines with Tammy, like I have a grief and loss specialist in my office, a therapist who's trained in grief, grief and loss. And she actually on occasion will have a grief and loss, non-death loss. So loss of relationships, loss of marriage, loss of, you know, maybe even connection with kids. but she kind of uses, she does some therapy with loss, like with a broader stroke. So it's not just death. Um, so you might call around and look around, look for some grief and loss specialists and maybe send them a message and say, do you do any loss work around divorce or, you know, around the marriage? Cause it looks like you have been doing a lot of, um, um, maybe you've been in the sex addiction place, you know, and dealing with all of that for a long time. And you may just need somebody that can help hold that pain and help you process it. Um, yeah. And community is important. So I agree with Tammy, find people who can relate, but even just fun people. So I can go and start rebuilding my life from this new chapter again. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Cause if I'm connecting and having some joy over here, you know, it lessens uh, you know, things on, on at least a level, so. Other questions or comments, so. Okay, so I, I, while we're waiting, I, I, this was a really good segue because one of the things I was thinking about talking, if we had time today, was about loss. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the, the person, whoever, whoever you are that just put the, con the, um, the comment in the chat or the question around divorce and finding support, every, every partner, family member, loved one, when you're working and being in, in relationship to somebody with an addiction are going to experience loss um, throughout that. There's no way not to. Um, and one of the things in recovery or in the healing process that we work with with our partners is you know, identifying those losses and the consequences of those losses. Um, it's kind of a painful thing to do, but an important thing because some losses can be reclaimed and some losses can't. Um, so sometimes we think of loss in the big thing like trust and money and those are, you know, those are super, super valuable, but you might even think, you know, kind of peel those layers back and see some of the losses could be just, I lost my friend, you know, I, we were good friends. Why did I fall in love with this person or, you know, or I birthed this person and now I have no connection with them. You know, these are my by people um, it might so it could be friendship it could be things like um, yeah just friendship connection it could be laughter how a lot of my partners say I feel like I've lost fun I've lost the fun in my life I feel like everything just got super serious really fast and it just stayed there so um, part of that balance and self-care is making sure that I still have fun I still have places where I can not think about everything that's serious, not live in denial, but every now and then it's okay to let go and not chew on this stuff so much and take care of, and, of yourself and have a good time and laugh. And that can be therapy in and of itself. Um, sometimes just companionship or time. If you think about time, lost time while 
the addicts acting out or while we're arguing about the addiction or, you know, there's a lot of time sometimes that's lost. So it might be a, an exercise to kind of sit down and kind of see if I can identify what some of the losses are, you know, or have been in my, in, in your life and what those consequences were for you. You know, what, what happened there and do that with a therapist, ideally somebody who can kind of help you. And now, now I know what I'm grieving. Now I know why I can't breathe sometimes when at night, when I go to sleep, because I've got a lot weighing on my heart. I've got a lot of loss weighing on my heart and death is just one loss we experience in this life. There are a lot of losses that we want to be aware of. So we don't shame ourselves about there's something wrong with me because I should get over this. And, you know, there's a lot of loss in, in living with an addiction, but there is recovery. You know, there is recovery of a lot of those losses and maybe post recovery when couples make it, or even individuals, if they don't, the marriage doesn't survive can usually they'll figure out how to be more deliberate about their time. They'll friendships will mean more, you know, they'll life kind of takes on a new meaning post trauma as we go into a growth stage and a new stage after we get out of that kind of crazy time. Um, so some of that can be recovered. So hold on to hope there, but know that grief is something we all will experience and we have to be deliberate about. Um, and I think it helps us process grief when we know what it is we're grieving. You know, if I'm grieving my friendship, if I am grieving trust and time and money and all that, then I can be really deliberate and, um, and I, and I have a voice to it. I can put a voice to it. I can put a word to it. I often say that if you're in the situation, you're grieving the loss of the relationship you thought you had, you know, when you hit get discovery, all of a sudden this relationship that you thought were together and we've got each other's backs and all of this, and I can trust this person and, and that's gone. So, you know, I think it is really important to, uh, to honor the, you that, um, but have the perspective with that. I've had relationships where um, uh, I was I was super close to my sister, probably too close to my sister for a while. But you know, we were we were very close, and and then she got involved with someone she eventually married and things. But like it it fractured and I had to grieve the loss of the relationship I had, you know, and it was, it was, it was painful, but you know, it was, I, I owned it and, you know, worked on it and, you know, obviously healed from it too. So, so we have some more questions. So I'll, do you want to say something? Did you want to tag? I was just going to follow up. Uh, yeah, maybe I was just going to follow up to accumulation of a lot of loss without maybe getting help and intervention can oftentimes lead to a compound loss. I don't know how else to say it or complex loss where all of a sudden now it's actually affected my health, um, my sleep. It could actually affect my ability to work, my career. Um, it could, it could, so I guess what I want to say about that is um, how you're feeling if you're in this is normal and it, it, all those losses are normal, but it's important that you intervene and understand what it is that's going on with you. So you so it doesn't get complex if we can help it, you know, just let's, let's be, let's be deliberate about grieving the losses that we've accumulated over the time and not pretend they're not there because, and, because they are, <laughs> and um, they usually need a voice and they need, um, they need to be expressed and they need to take that path of healing um, again, very deliberately. And there's very good therapists, you know, people who specialize in sex addiction treatment or betrayal treatment, but also even other therapists too, who can help with that grief and loss. There's a really good comment in here. Just a comment. When I was in marriage counseling, clueless on porn addiction, I went through bouts of crying, more like sobbing uncontrollably for days. I realized I was grieving the relationship I thought I had. The illusion my husband tried to present. That's the hardest thing to realize the years I spent under the veil. I think that is, that is a very very common it, it really is you're grieving the dream right you're dream, you're grieving i married this person or i'm with this person i chose this person or, or i had these children or you know i thought it would be this way and my life did not turn out the way it doesn't mean my life can't be amazing and good but 
but it's going to be different maybe than that dream. So that would be a loss. And that is probably one of the most painful realities, I think, that couples face when they're dealing with this sort of infidelity in the relationship. So the next question, I was married for 10 years to a sex addict, among other things. I have been divorced for six years and now in a four-year relationship. The past year, there have been many red flags that I find concerning. There hasn't been any physical cheating that I'm aware of, but emotional for sure. There is porn, but I don't believe he's being honest with me about it, the frequency. He blames me for not making him feel like he is a priority. I am working on my betrayal trauma, but he thinks my concern with his behavior and choices is coming from the group I am in for partners of sex addicts and says I'm putting him in a category. He now claims I am an alcoholic, which is not the case, but what can I do to help him look at his own behaviors and how they trigger me? I'd like this relationship to work, but I can't trust that he won't go back to the same behaviors because he doesn't understand what is wrong with it. Yeah, so there's a lot. Sounds like there's a kind of a lot going on here for you. Um, you had obviously you were in a relationship where you had accumulated trauma. Uh, you know, we were, you were betrayed and got out of that that relationship. Now you're in another one that maybe you know hasn't gone to that place, but but there's still some areas in which he lacks transparency or just being upfront. That's what I'm re that's what I'm hearing. Certainly, correct me if I'm <laughs> add whatever you need to add. Um, but I think one of the things that happen with the trauma you were in the very first relationship and even this one. Um, when we are met with defensiveness, when we say to, to somebody, you know, gosh, I just don't feel connected to you, or you're just, you're not being, I just feel like you're being honest with me, or I feel like you're not giving me enough information. And they immediately maybe throw that, well, I think you're an alcoholic, or that's because of your group. We call that gaslighting in our world, which means I can't deal with that. So I'm going to light a fire over here and over here and over here. So I don't have to deal with the fire right here. Um, that's how I kind of douse that. I kind of create this, this, this major distraction. I think one of the things that's important for partners is to learn how to trust your gut, how to trust. If your needs aren't being met, that's enough. That's enough. I don't, it sounds like you don't really know all of what may be happening. He might just not have good attachment. He might not know how to show up emotionally for you. It might not be that he's an addict or doing things like that, but you know, it's painful to be alone in a relationship. We're supposed to bond as a pair, as a couple, like we're supposed to be, you know, each other's each other, not everything, but you know, we're supposed to be able to rely on each other and, you know, be able to have difficult conversations and not be gaslit, you know? And so I would say, this is probably, this is the therapist in me, so I'm going <laughs> to, but find it, find a good therapist, a good couples EFT therapist or something. And I would start, I would ask him to do that. That would probably be, you know, see if he's willing to participate in that. And let's figure out what's going on here under the surface. And let's figure out, is this just our connection styles not working together? Like we're not sure how to make that, or is there more, you know, more going on here? And um, that would be my that would be my best advice because I think it sounds like there's just, there's a lot of turmoil there for you. And when you try and talk to him, you get gaslit or, you know, all this distraction. Um, so I would get, again, a very qualified therapist that can maybe even, this would be a good case for an EFT therapist, somebody who's trained in couples work using EFT. And in the chat, it's emotionally focused therapy. I saw Tammy put that mm -hmm. in there. So I would start there. I really would. And I wouldn't apologize for what I need. What you need is what you need. And he might not understand it. He might not be able to meet it. It might scare him. Um, he might be defensive because of that. But either way, it would be worth learning some skills as to how to do that. So, And it's information. So you, you add lacking a lot of transparency and openness. He tells half the truth a lot of the time. And uh, uh, so... so to me, if somebody's willing to meet me and um, and they are intention, you know, it's okay to say I, I understand that this scares you, and here's you know what I hear you saying. But you know, if we are really working towards moving forward on a path, you know, 
I would want somebody that is supportive of me. I can be supportive of them. And so I think it's information for you if you have mutually aligned goals. So I love the idea of going to a, a therapist and, you know, having the, the conversations and, um, uh, and figuring out if, you know, it, it, it may be that you can work on this and move forward together. It may be that your styles are really different and he's never going to be able to step up. It's information. So um, I think we all deserve to be loved. I think we all deserve to have, um, you know, I mean, nobody can meet all our needs. You know, I'm not, I'm not that um, Pollyanna, I guess, but, um, but, you know, if somebody's trying, you know, and they're, you know, they're willing and they're not turning around and blaming you. You know, we, you know, we always talk on these webinars is, you know, they're acting out or they're whatever. It's got nothing to do with you. You know, they can say, I, I need you to be, make me more of a priority. Well, what does that look like? You know, so if they're concrete and it's something that actually makes sense to you, great. If it doesn't, great. But to just you have random comments of, you know, I'm whatever, it, you get the point. And we all come from our own reality, right? We, we all have our own reality. I remember, I've been married for 30 years, and I remember early on in my marriage, my husband comes from this family where anger meant violence. I come from a family where anger meant um, uh, passive aggressive, like silence, <laughs> you know, like it was silent treatment. That's what we got. So when I would ask my husband early in the marriage, are you angry? Are you mad? He would immediately get defensive, not because... <laughs> but because his idea like of mad was violence and he's never been a violent person. So it offended his sensibilities because his definition was different. He came with a different, so we had to figure out how to work within our own paradigm, our own experience. And it wasn't that he was right and I was wrong and vice versa. It was that we, there was a lot we had to learn about each other and and how the world is colored for each of us so that we can be sensitive to that. So I don't ask him anymore, are you mad? I ask him, how are you feeling? What's going on with you? So, because just the word mad was a trigger word for him. And so, so that's a, that's where therapy I think can be so helpful. It, and I don't know if that's what's partially going on, but as he's only telling half truths, I would wonder, like, what's his experience? What did he bring to this relationship? And then you have your experience and what you brought to the relationship. And there may be all sorts of triggers and fears on both sides that we really aren't, we're, we're dealing with the like outside information, but inside there's something deeper going on there that we want to address. That's what EFT gets to is they, they stop the noise out here and they try and get to what's the real conflict. What's going well, on? Here? And she adds, he is speaking with a therapist, but I don't believe he is honest with her and telling her what he has done to me as far as other women. So it feels like it feels like there's more to the story. And first of all, he's seeing a therapist, not that you know, apparently you haven't been involved in the process. This is another one of those. I know I already mentioned the couples workshop um, at Seeking Integrity, but it's a great place because you guys, uh, so, so how this works, just to give you a little background is each person fills out a questionnaire. So, and it's separate. So, you know, each party gets a questionnaire, you know, after you're registered and it's so that the facilitator, Paul Hartman, uh, who does an amazing job, um, you know, has the information. And so he can, he hears from both of you and then he helps pull all that together so that when you leave the intensive, you're on a better communication path, but also have um, ex like there's clarity on expectations and hopefully some resolution on, you know, what, you know, what the sticking points are. So, so in, in my opinion, um, him just working with a therapist without your you know, without you having met with the therapist and sharing your side of it or whatever, or the two of you having a qualified couples therapist, particularly with this sounds more like there's more going on than you know, just looking at some porn or whatever, you know, this feels like, you know, there's infidelity and, and some other, I mean, that's lack of trust. So, so I would invite you to look at that. And we don't hide if we don't hide things if we have nothing to hide. As right. As so, and, and that's not to scare anybody because I don't really know, but I think um, his therapist, fine. A couple's therapist, awesome. Your own therapist, even better. Then, then the three can communicate, best case scenario. 
Um, when I'm talking to somebody, if I'm a, somebody's therapist and I'm talking to the couple's therapist and we have, we're able to communicate, that's the best case for the couple. That intensive Tammy's talking about automatically pulls that together, which is awesome. So yeah. you're in a weekend, you, you know, it's a very compressed time, but which, which is helpful because, you know, like you can go week after week after week after week, or you can come for a weekend. doesn't mean that you don't need some help afterwards, but um, yeah, that's, uh, so, so we have one in the, ch um, uh, what are options if we can't afford all the therapy and intensives? There's all of the stuff on the um, sexandrelationshiphealing.com is free, um, but it, you know, it, it, it's support. It only can do so much. So, um, well, so I would, I would really be looking, I don't know in that, in that, you know, if we've done a lot of therapy um, and maybe it hasn't been, you know, we haven't got to what we need to, or we haven't seen a change in behavior, you know, maybe I refilter some of that money into an intensive. Yeah. Instead yeah. of individual or something like that, that that's an idea. And I realize I think what Dr. Rob's done here on the site and get all these, there's so many of us who donate our time to try and be helpful um, and answer questions. And at least you can connect with and communicate with and ask some important questions is a great resource. And I'm just one hour. There's like, I don't know how many Tammy does a lot of them, multiple a week. So yeah, but, but um, yeah, you know, and one of the things I've noticed is oftentimes people think they can't afford therapy and I'm like, can I afford not to get the help I need to, to make this difference? So, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, can I sacrifice a few, you know, things here and there, um, you know, to make it so that I can you know, budget out for that. Cause you know, w it, you know, it, it, the, the struggle, the pain, the emotional toll, I'm going to read you one, you know, in a moment, but I mean, there's health consequences to, you know, living in trauma all the time too. So, so I would invite you to consider those things. So the next one is in the chat, but it says I'm a mid fifties, um, female and I need to heal my body, my mind. I've recently noticed how I keep my shoulders tight and up near my ears compulsively. A lifetime of this probably contributed to my chronic migraine. All the gaslighting betrayal risk of being exposed to HIV has been overwhelming. And we, we hear, you know, you know autoimmune diseases and chronic, you know, chronic medical conditions with dealing with with the betrayal trauma. So uh, this person left their partner who was, I was financially dependent on without a plan. I'm trying to rebuild my career and self-esteem. Can't afford a therapist right now. I found that I jumped right into another pro-dependent relationship with an old friend. I think this all stems from my severely dysfunctional childhood and family history. A friend told me that I might be able to apply for disability um, with, because of the, um, co the CPTSD and ADHD dyslexia. I feel like I hit bottom. Do you know anything about that? I, and I don't. Do you know anything if you can? Well, I want to just say, um, I'm, kind of, I'm sorry for where you are. I yeah. feel like you've been through a lot and you took a very courageous step to finally say, whatever that was, and for whatever reason, I can't do this any longer. Um, even when I didn't know what the plan ahead was, which is such a, you know, such an act of faith and, you know, on your part. Um, I'm really glad you're here. Um, I would participate in as many partners groups as I could here um, on the this site. Um, find support groups for, you know, and resources. Sometimes support groups will have good resources. Um, to be able to help, if I, it's particularly if I can't afford therapy. Um, and if you have a pro-dependent relationship, I would assume that was a very healthy one. So we want pro, when we say we want pro-dependent relationships, we want ones that, um, we want relationships in which I can stay connected and um, that can be supportive, that can be non-judgmental and non-critical. Um, and so I would really, really build my tribe, so to speak, around me. I would just really get people around me that could support me, could challenge me appropriately um, when I need it, but could also hold emotional pain. There's still a lot going on. The complex PTSD at some point will probably need to be treated um, by a professional. So if that can't happen right now, at least create that you know, your daily balance by doing your dailies, creating a tribe around you, good, good support. Um, and doing the things like you're doing here to come out of isolation and have, you know, and learn. Um, there's lots of good reading. There's lots of, like I said, good support groups. I would keep doing that until you can potentially find a resource to help with, with therapy with some of that. 
Well, and, and as far as, I mean, I, I don't even know how you apply for disability, but I sure would reach out and try, you know, you got nothing to lose. I, I, I have, somebody told me once um, when I'm stressed, they said, you wear your shoulders as earrings. And I was, I've always remembered that. And I find that if I've got, you know, if I find that my shoulders are up like this, you know, I have to practice, you know, pushing them down. I do, you know, I, I mean, I do physical things where I'm pushing my shoulders down. You know, I don't do yoga well, but, you know, I'll do a few things that help, you know, release anything where I can be intentional about working out, you know, that particular area breathing that breathing that I mentioned all that stuff just helps me relax and recenter and you know I had to I had to work on building up my back muscles because I had I had started hunching over so much that my back muscles were all stretched out and I didn't want to be upright so I was very intentional about you know working on those muscles you know it's all doable and honestly focusing on doing some of those things you know I was focused on doing that it was actually a helpful thing for me and you know now I'm mostly upright and mostly my shoulders are in the right spot so you know it's um, like I think just pick little things and you add so I guess it was codependent and like we really I almost bristle at the word now I, you know I, I, I you know it sounds like you have a friend that's willing to support you when you're really struggling well that's awesome you know and that doesn't mean it's a codependent relationship that just means you've got a really good friend and you know what if the shoe was on the other foot and you could you know be supportive of your friend I bet you would. That doesn't that doesn't make it an unhealthy relationship. It just means right now you need some support. Somebody's there. Yay! Build more of a tribe, like Kim said. Make sure that you're um, you know you're getting more support because you deserve it. And uh, uh, I love the getting connections on the dropping. There's we got bunches of stuff on here. Keep coming back. Yeah, I'm with Tammy. Code remember, um, codependent is just not a thing. <laughs> yeah culture thing but it's not a thing it's not a thing. we are built for attachment we are built for healthy interdependence mm -hmm. we cannot do this alone the idea that we could become healthy all by ourselves is a misnomer it is false information this is what prodependence is all about it's about having healthy interdependent relationships where we're not shamed for loving um, getting help giving help loving people who we're connected to, but learning how to do that in the healthiest way possible. We don't need a label. Nobody needs a label. I don't need a label. You know, certainly we have diagnosis that we have to deal with, but we don't need any extra. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so let's yeah. not wear codependent. I think like Tammy said, we just good for you for having some relationships. Find more. If that particular relationship doesn't feel, you know, healthy to you, then keep looking for and building that building that um, circle for yourself building that net um i use a baseball on my shoulders honestly yeah, like, yeah. i get i mean a baseball anything hard yeah. I use it at the end of my day when i'm listening to my meditations mm -hmm. and lose you know just releasing some of this tension here mm -hmm. that i carry and a lot of people do mm -hmm. carry all of their stress um and I really practice pushing them down because I've got mm -hmm. like football shoulders. I always want to go free. <laughs> so I have to really work on it. But boy, when I do, it, it's like it turns on the circulation in my brain or something. Yeah. Well, and I think there's a little bit of a just being intentional about that. You know, it's kind of like the box breathing. It's like you're being intentional about something else. So it kind of clears, you know, the stress and, and chaos away. So, yeah. But we, the, 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 and, and there's so many YouTubes online, you know, for some mindfulness or, you know, yoga or whatever. So it's all, you know, there's free stuff. So, you know, there's lots of free stuff and just find what, you know, feels good to you and, you know, look for a little progress and go, gosh, my shoulders are a tiny bit lower this week. Yay. You know, that's progress. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So thank you guys so much for being here today, for participating, for your questions. That was awesome. It just makes us so much better. I hope you'll come back. I'll be back in two weeks. Yeah. I'm on the first and third Fridays, but there are these groups, webinars every day. Uh, Dr. Rob, even himself, you can access him if you have questions for him a couple of times a week. So um, participate. Um, SI is a wonderful resource for, for healing and I'm grateful to be a part of it and hopefully I'll see you all in two weeks. And we're grateful you participate. You do a great job. Thanks so much, Kim. Thanks everybody. Bye.